Spring 2013 was my last semester of graduate school. I was studying criminology, criminal justice, and completing my capstone project. Because of this project, I became more knowledgeable about an issue I feel is pervasive in society, slut shaming. For those of you who don't know this term, I snagged a definition from yourdictionary.com. Slut shaming is an act of making any person, and I'm adding primarily women here, feel guilty or inferior for certain sexual behaviors or desires that deviate from traditional gender expectations. So when a woman, woman enjoys sexual activity, she is deemed a slut. If a woman has multiple sex partners, she is deemed a slut. If a woman wears revealing clothing, you guessed it, slut. Project What is Slut, which was the title of my capstone project, focused on the third aspect of slut shaming I just mentioned, the mentality that the wearing of revealing clothing equates to sluttiness. Throughout my exploration of the subject, I was able to draw connections between slut shaming and the prevalent rape myth of clothing equals consent. Or more plainly, when a woman wears provocative clothing, she is asserting her availability and consent for sexual activity. When viewers perceive that a woman is available and consenting based on her attire, sexual advances, even ones with some measure of violence, become viable and justifiable options. She was asking for it. She had it coming. Isn't that what she wanted anyways? Why else would she dress like that? Since sexual assault happens only because a perpetrator chooses to violate a person, this proclamation is false. A woman's clothing has nothing to do with signifying her consent, especially at the public level. Sure, there are sexy clubbing outfits, the tighter the better, or lingerie with lace and ribbons galore, but clothing is not indicative of consent. The person wearing the clothes is the only person who can clearly give it. We also know that many individuals who have worn non-provocative clothing have been the victims of unspeakable acts. So why does this myth still abound? That's a pretty broad question, and it could take hours to scratch the surface, so I want to direct our attention onto shaming and the role that it plays in perpetuating violence against women. Now, when I was investigating slut shaming, I noticed that several other types of shaming behaviors existed. People were shamed for their weight, their class, and even for sillier things such as salad shaming or selfie shaming. According to a website I frequent, Jezebel.com, 2013 was the year for shaming. It was big news. But was 2013 the pinnacle year for shaming behavior, or was this simply a result of the virility of the interwebs? Shaming in itself has been a tool used for behavior modification for hundreds, maybe thousands of years. Societies in the past used shame and humiliation as a method to alter and shape the behavior of their citizens. Think of the stockade blocks where deviants were publicly humiliated, or Hester Prynne, who was forced to display her deviance in the form of a scarlet A across her chest. Yes, I know that this second example is fiction, but fiction often describes prevalent ideas that exist in reality. Homogenous societies are able to agree upon standards of behavior that most citizens voluntarily comply with. Once these standards are violated, action is quickly taken to ensure that it never happens again. This was done at both the micro level, the individual themselves was made to know that their action was wrong through shaming, and the macro level, society as a whole saw an example of how violators were treated. Shaming was an attempt to change and deter unwanted behavior and to maintain and reinforce socially desirable behavior, the status quo of the time. I want to briefly touch on a current theoretical model that exists in the criminal justice system. In 1989, John Braithwaite published a book that introduced the theory of reintegrative shaming. Braithwaite believes that if perpetrators were made to feel guilty about their actions, deterrence from criminal activity would be a result. Shaming must be done in such a way that an offender is not pushed further away from societal inclusion. Reintegration with the community is the ultimate goal, where the behavior is denounced, but the person is still valued and helped to be restored to good standing. While Braithwaite's theory works well in societies that have low levels of individuality and high senses of community, quite unlike the U.S., there are still some things that we can take from his work. Another justice model, restorative justice, dovetails well with Braithwaite's ideas. Restorative justice seeks to repair the harm that criminal activity has caused. Offenders take accountability for their action and work on a plan to repair the harm and to move forward positively, all with the help of the victim in the community. Guilt and shame may be a piece of the reintegrative shaming restorative justice puzzle, but it is not the end game. 
helping to reduce recidivism and promote victor, offender, and community satisfaction through positive intervention is the main component of these criminal justice initiatives. But when shaming is put into place in the justice system, it is sometimes carried out in a manner that is full of flaws. Judges have handed down sentences that include dressing up like a chicken, sleeping in a doghouse, and cutting off a teenager's ponytail. We make juveniles wear sandwich boards proclaiming their crimes in front of City Hall. We plaster the faces of DUI offenders all over the newspaper. One notorious sheriff in Arizona was known for making his inmates wear pink underwear, handcuffs, and flip-flops, and forcing them to sleep in tents where outdoor temperatures reach well above 100 degrees Fahrenheit. When we dehumanize individuals in ways that humiliate them and make them feel inferior, is justice really being served? These actions have lost the integrative part of reintegrative shaming. They seek only to publicly humiliate an offender. Brene Brown summed up the difference between guilt and shame pretty well in one of her TED Talks. I'm going to quote her. There's a huge difference between guilt and shame. Shame is highly, highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, eating disorders. Guilt inversely correlated with these things. Guilt, the ability to hold something we've done or failed to do up against who we want to be, is incredibly adaptive. It's uncomfortable, but adaptive. The type of shaming that members of the criminal justice system have participated in approach deterrence from a one-sided narrow place, a place where shame and humiliation partner with each other to make a person feel bad and to show society that there are punishments for acting out of the norm. Why am I bringing up the criminal justice system? I mean, it's what I study and teach about, so I like talking about it, but why am I talking about it right now? For one, sexual assault and violence against women are crimes. There are things, they are things in our society the justice system seeks to eradicate. For two, our justice system, as impartial as it attempts to be, mirrors the thoughts and actions of the people who influence it the most. And repeatedly and relatedly, we can look to the justice system to show us the proper and just way of handling things, at least how it was ideally designed. If an ordinary person were to look at the examples from a few moments ago, where shaming was introduced to the justice system through public humiliation, what would that person learn? And what about the past practices of public shaming? What is it that can be learned from the formalized use of shame as punishment throughout our history? You learn that it's part of our culture, our heritage, that shame is something that should be meted out to those who violate social norms and break laws. Shaming can start in childhood and continue on into adulthood. Think about the phrases, you're being a spoiled brat, stop acting like a sissy, your brother isn't acting naughty like you. Phrases like this can be heard by youth across the nation. It is a normalized part of society, but at what cost? Ms. Brown said that shame is highly correlated with addiction, depression, violence, aggression, bullying, suicide, and eating disorders. Research has shown that shame is not an effective behavioral deterrent. So why do we keep doing it? Shame towards offenders, criminals, lawbreakers, that makes sense to some. These individuals did the crime, and now they need to be punished. In some people's eyes, there's a reason to shame them, no matter how unjustified it might seem to others. But coming back to slut shaming, why are women women shamed for participating in acts that are deemed to be overtly sexual? And bringing domestic violence into the picture, why are victims often shamed in the public setting as well? You get the, why is she still with that person comments? Or if my partner was hitting me, I'd just leave. She must be desperate, stupid, lazy, part of the reason she gets abused lines. There are hundreds of jokes about rape and domestic violence making light of the situation. What this type of talk does is dehumanize the victim and demand that they own some of the blame for what happened to them. Slut shaming reduces a woman to her clothing or her sexuality, while shaming abuse victims criticizes their fortitude and resolve, turning them into simpering things who are asking for it. And that's what it boils down to, those words. She was asking for it. But if she was asking for it, then it's not a crime to, to abuse her. If her clothes represent her consent or her refusal to leave represents her acquiescence to physical violence, then no wrongdoing has occurred. These rationalizations are wrong and they are leading to tragic consequences. And what, per- and what perpetuates this type of thinking is something I like to think of as a cy- cycle of shame as it relates to violence against women. The first step, a woman or girl is publicly humiliated, called out for her style of dress or blamed for not leaving her abusive partner. 
The next step of the cycle is for an individual perpetrator to shame a victim before they abuse or assault them. So on both the macro societal level and the individual level, the environment of shame has been created. The next step would be shame during an act of abuse, and the step after that, shame after the abusive act. Both of these steps attempt to alleviate the burden of responsibility from the shoulders of the perpetrator to the shoulders of the victim. The final step is the self-shame that victims can deliver onto themselves. I must have had something to do with it. When one hears shame coming from so many different facets, it becomes difficult to ignore. When victims and potential victims are reminded of the, of the objectification of women on social media, in song lyrics, and from the people who make up their community, the truth becomes so diluted with shame that it's hard to discern. Victims can internalize this. Victims can believe that they are part of the problem, or the whole problem itself, and the cycle re can repeat itself many times over. What can we do to stop this from happening? When shaming is such an ingrained part of the world that we live in, I'm going to qu quote Brene Brown again. She said that shame cannot survive empathy. Empathy. The people who are shamed are not receiving empathy. They are receiving malicious judgment. Not all shamers are nefarious evildoers. They generally believe that they are promoting positive behavior. What us empathetic do-gooders can promote is for them to hold back that judgment. I know I sure as heck don't say everything that pops into my head. I might be seen as a bit strange if that happened. Many times it's preferable to hold back your thoughts about how someone appears or acts. Why do you feel justified in speaking negatively about them? Ask yourself if their style of dress is really harming you. There certainly are despicable, violent, hate-filled people on the earth, but the vast majority of people, almost all of them, do not fall under that umbrella. The individuals you are shaming do not deserve it. Collective responsibility. This is something that should be embraced. Recognize your part in the problem and try to fix it. If one of your friends turns to you and comments on how someone looks, dresses, ask them why it matters to them and how it can make the person feel if they were to have overheard it. If someone tells a joke that makes light of domestic violence, tell them that it offends you and bring up some facts about the harmful effects that this type of, this type of violence can have. If you see individuals posting harmful messages about sexual assault on social media, private message them to, or report it. These are small steps, but collectively, and if everyone does them, they can add up in a big way. If you feel like someone is being victimized, offer your assistance or your support. Monica Lewinsky recently spoke at a TED event about the slut shaming that was directed at her during her early 20s. What helped her to recover from an international level of shaming was kindness from fellow people. She said, I've seen some very dark days in my life, and it was the compassion and empathy from my family friends, professionals, and sometimes even strangers that saved me. Even empathy from one person can make a difference. Never ever underestimate the power of one. The spread of shame is possible because of the quickness that people accept it and regurgitate it. Fight that. Keep it contained. If shame has the power to dehumanize, then shame is worth fighting against.